I don't know if you can tell, but I rarely skip lunch. In fact, I'm a staunch supporter of most meals and especially lunch. And that is why I'm dressed as the single most glorious head of cabbage you will ever see. Look, we are practically sisters. Mwah. This versatile vegetable connects Africa, Asia, and Europe culturally and culinarily. And believe me, we need those connections to deal with the challenges of climate change and ecological collapse. We are talking about redistribution, but we also have to talk about a distribution of land here. If there would be an opportunity to grow on uh, small, smaller hectares, but yield more, that would be the way to go, right? Because the bigger the land to work on, you know, the more resources. Famine is like also off obviously as or like starvation is a tool of war, is a weapon of war. So it's really, it's just like this also survival response of I'm going to eat as much as I can now because I won't have much for later instead of preserving. Some parts of my, my consciousness uh, still remember this, this uh, 100 year old experience of my grandmother, this experience of famine. And if you have a belly, appreciate it. You might need it very soon. <laughs> Keep it as your, as, as your savings account. Welcome to Standard Time, a Eurozine and Display Europe production. Here we offer thoughtful conversations of cross-European interest, from fast fashion to walkable cities, sexually transmitted diseases, and even... Oop. I'm Mareka Kingapop, editor-in-chief of said Eurozine, the magazine presenting this show, and a co-founder of Display Europe, a platform offering European content in 15 different languages. The European parliamentary elections have just drawn to a close, and so has this show's season. But have no fear, we'll be back in no time, or a couple months. And since this is a digital production, you get to watch your previous episodes while you wait for the next ones, on your own time, your respective standard time. I say watch it, but we also started to publish our episodes in podcast format, and you can find them both on displayeurope.eu. Just look for Standard Time Talk Show on any podcast app or your usual video platforms, but also come check out our new content sharing platform, Display Europe. Special shout out to all of those listening to us while folding their laundry. You better loosen your clothes for this hot topic. Whoa, 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 slow down. I'm only talking about global warming. In today's episode, we discuss how climate change affects food systems. Because although we talk often of transit and other industries polluting, we don't seem to consider industrial farming as great a culprit as it really is. And it affects us all. Who doesn't like to eat? I mean, I can think of a few people, but whether you're a jolly glutton like myself or enjoy restricting and refusing necessities, it is clear that those of us who have the privilege of accessing safe and affordable nutrition often take it for granted. However you choose to shop for food in metro areas, whether at a farmer's market or at a supermarket, you better keep in mind where it comes from, both geographically and biologically. One study from 2022 found that less than half of European consumers trust where their food actually comes from, and only 37% believe that their food is truly sustainable. <gasps> Many are interested in organic produce and sustainable resources, but industrial farming doesn't really prioritize these values, neither on the corporate nor on the policy level. The EU has started to flirt with the idea of degrowth instead of green growth, and experts advocate for replacing the current economic metrics such as GDP, which are focused on abstract financial gain. So instead, we could use figures and factors that center society and allow for a more complex understanding of trade, industry, and finances. You know, modern social and economic theories were largely built on the idea of a teleological path of progress. That is, the very false idea that humanity is moving a particular direction along a linear line and perpetual growth and expansion are the keys to great societies represented by this very cabbage. Now, it doesn't take a PhD to see why this is a problematic idea. To start with, our resources aren't endless, and they never will be. Importantly, human history is not linear. This concept views certain societies as more optimal and expects the others to try and catch up with the leaders, which ultimately traps them in a development limbo forever. 
ultimately, we reach the level of overproduction and overconsumption where we have more commodities than would be needed for the entire globe, but billions of people are living in extreme poverty because we don't distribute wealth or resources fairly. Instead of this global insanity, degrowth promotes decreasing our global consumption and living off of less resources and more cabbage. Yes, that could mean paying a higher price for your finely brewed coffee, <gasps> which is currently produced by abused and exploited workers in Guatemala. It would also focus on shorter trade distances, local produce and positive interdependence between sectors. I personally don't think it would be a tragedy if Europe and North America tried taking up a little less of the global resources. They have been exploiting the entire global south for quite some time. Because the current trade systems create a lot of dependence, but these are rarely positive ones. Industrial farming is entirely reliant on fossil fuels, both for operating the heavy machinery that replaced agriculture workers and for heavily polluting agrochemicals, fertilizers, pesticides, fungicides. If you want to know more about these chemicals and their impact on nature, check out our episode on bees. Speaking of industrial farming, Russia's war in Ukraine has had severe consequences on the Arab world, as half of Ukraine's wheat production is exported there, leading to a sharp increase in the price of bread. Historically, such events have served as a catalyst of political upheaval in the region. In 2021, the inflation of food products reached the same level that led to the Arab Spring. Just a tiny side note to you, mon petit chou. The rise of the price of bread was the original reason for the Great French Revolution in 1789 as well. Food sovereignty has always been about controlling resources. And as long as they're not in the hands of the people who produce, the fight for farmers' rights prevails. From the renewed protests in India or the ones against the EU's Green New Deal here in Europe, they expose neoliberal agricultural models that center economic competition over environmental protection. Within the European Union, family farms and small-scale farming has been on a severe decline across the past couple of decades. Both leftist and right-wing politics are trying to co-opt the farmers' struggles. Only a couple months before the EP elections, the far right has managed to infuse the movement with europhobia and anti-immigration rhetoric, but that is far from new. Right-wing politicians have long had ties with agribusinesses and this false claim of protecting family farms comes for personal gain. Who would have thought that climate protection would serve as a great excuse to continue harming the environment? I just find it very ironic that in an attempt to fix things, European neoliberalism manages to propose just weak enough solutions to still find itself in a pickle. And speaking of pickles, these cute cucumbers have followed us across the season from library to library, and for good reason. They were produced and preserved by my aunt Kati in her garden and are an integral part of my cultural heritage. Our guests are here to chum down on them with me. Tendai Ganduri is a Zimbabwean scholar from the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. She has been awarded the Digital Humanism Fellowship from the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna, where she is currently researching how climate change is communicated on Twitter using Zimbabwe and South Africa as case studies. Macha Jakubowiak is deputy editor-in-chief of Dwutigodnik magazine, one of Eurozine's partner publications from Poland. He is a writer and essayist and has been awarded the Adam Vlodek Prize, amongst others. His Dwutigodnik essay, Folk Stories, The Paunch, is freshly published in Eurozine and explores the cultural and national history behind his family's relationship to food, famine and body image issues. And finally, our very own writer-editor of the show, Salma Shaka, who's a multimedia artist and researcher raised between Palestine, Cyprus and the United Arab Emirates. Her work tackles topics of land reclamation, indigenous imagination and anti-colonial struggles in relation to feeding and foraging rituals from the Arab and Mediterranean region. <music> Hello and welcome. Thanks for coming on the show, all the three of you. Tendai, let's start with you. You uh, research currently how uh, climate change is being communicated um, on uh, social media. What do you see? Do people actually get the information that they need? I decided to look at how possibly the citizens critique their governments. As you can imagine from, from social media, the, the voices are so diverse. 
And to complement the digital conversations, I went and conducted interviews in the disaster-stricken communities, offer a comparison, you know, to, to say is the digital voice is a true reflection of, of, of what those who are affected actually have to say about, about uh, climate change. I'm working with a hypothesis. So my project, uh, the ongoing PhD project, is about um, how climate change is communicated and contested. Practically looking at every conversation uh, around the sec selected case studies of COP26, COP27, and also localized disasters in my case countries of Zimbabwe and South Africa. So I'm drawing those conversations from uh, the 2022 floods, which affected uh, mostly the Deben area. It's a Queenie municipality in South Africa. And I'm also looking at um, drawing the conversations from Cyclone Idai of 2019 in the context of uh, Zimbabwe. So for Zimbabwe, the Digital Voices is vehemently against the government. So at domestic level, support the government. Then we go to the case country of um, South Africa. At domestic level, not support the government. At global level, not support the government. Salma, you came with a plate of zathar, and um, your interest is very much in food sovereignty, production sovereignty, land ownership, land reclamation. Why a plate of zatar to, uh, to open with? To me, zatar is really just like a marker of like identity, specifically like the Palestinian one. It's like you, everyone has a jar of zatar laying around in the cupboard. It's also been co-opted or just like as part and parcel of Israeli cuisine. Zatar means thyme in, um, in English. It also indicates the spice mix, which is made up of sesame, salt, olive oil, and different things. Up until today, actually, so like both Zatar, uh, old Zatar sage, as well as Akub, which is uh, the Latin word for it, is gondulia. So they have been banned. There's a very nice, uh, beautiful documentary from a year ago called Foragers. Um, which is which basically follows Palestinians or Palestinian farmers trying to forage from like the hills in East Jerusalem, but then also trying to um, hide from Israeli authorities, the Nat Nat Nature and Parks authorities. We want to introduce you to the work of our friend and colleague Claire Potter, who is a professor emeritus of history at the New School for Social Research and the co-executive editor of Public Seminar, one of Eurasian's partner journals. Her blog, Political Junkie, and podcast, Why Now?, are available to read and listen to on Substack. Find her under clairepotter.substack.com. Globally, in agricultural production, we produce way more um, actually more than would be necessary to feed the full global human population. Much of that goes to waste, and yet famine and scarcity are very real. But in much of Europe, I would say, or in a significant portion of Europe, famine and scarcity are a historical, a part of a historical legacy. And Mache, this is where your article comes in, because it, in your Partially in your new book and in this article we just published from Dvultigodnik, you trace the experience of famine as kind of a cultural pattern that informs how your family operates, you, even your sort of emotional connections. Can you tell us about this, please? Well, it starts from the, from, from the observation of a belly, of a belly which is a little bit bigger uh, than the uh, advertisements <laughs> and the marketing uh, would assume. Uh, my belly, to be specific, uh, body shape, and you know uh, your relation to your to your body, uh, to your to your health. Today seems to be uh, limited to individual uh, individual perspective. You're supposed to take care of your body and to make it look uh, uh, proper, right? And I'm looking into history of my family to try to understand what happened. Uh, what happened in the history of my family and more generally in the history uh, of the country I live in and in the history of Poland that somehow shaped <laughs> shaped my belly. In, in, in history of my family there, there are two uh, interesting elements <laughs> who are uh, my grandmother and my mother. 
and uh, they were very different different women. Uh, the first one, my grandmother, uh, she um, experienced uh, famine and hunger living in a small uh, small village uh, in Poland uh, near Oświęcim, better known as Auschwitz. Well, the first time that sh she had an ability uh, to eat properly, when she was moved by the Nazis uh, to work as a, as, a, as a slave on a German farm, and she, she had lagged. Her basic experience was that uh, for the first time in her in her life, and she was 16, 17 at the time, uh, she uh, she could eat as uh, as much as she wanted. Uh, so when she gave birth to my mother, um, I I suppose she did everything she could uh, uh, so her daughter wouldn't that would never need to experience famine. That created a completely different person, a person uh, with a tendency to, you know, to, over, to overeat. And somehow these practices of these two women uh, came up to create and to shape my eating practices, you know, trying to somehow fit into a modern contemporary uh, model of a body. But at the same time, some, some parts of my, my consciousness uh, still remember this this a uh, hundred year old experience of my grandmother. This experience of famine. It shines a light uh, on the politics of foods uh, happening in in Poland and I suppose in in other countries in Europe. Uh, early this spring, we had a big uh, farmers' protests against the European Green Deal, and the basic basic manifesto of farmers uh, opposing the Green Deal. They need to provide uh, food safety for the people living in Poland. So the slogan uh, was uh, catching up with people because they still have this somehow a memory or experience, even if it's an experience of their grandmothers, and uh, this experience of famine. It took me decades to understand why my parents, they are always collecting and and taking inventory of everything, including food. They grew up with an experience of a scarcity economy. They were sort of trained to never expect things to be available. And when I tell them to declutter and all that, it, it just feels like arrogance to them because this is not what they grew up with. And then I come in with Marie Kondo and tell them to <laughs> just chuck everything that doesn't spark joy. <laughs> they think of me because I don't seem to spark too much joy with this bullshit. <laughs> And fairly so. Tenda, you said that you are kind of reluctant to engage with the concept of degrowth. Is it a first world problem? And should we just be a bit more conceptual about this? When it comes to food security and uh, sustainable studies, I think um, approaching it on a context basis is always the way to go. And then we come to degrowth. Is it a model to be pursued? Certainly. Is it feasible? context, bring the numbers and so forth. Is it applicable at the moment in my case context, in my case studies? I am reluctant to, to go for it. We still need the green growth. We need the mechanization. There wouldn't be like um, a lot to, to cut back on anyway. So yes, I think degrowth right now, not for my case context, uh, but it's certainly something to explore, especially towards uh, you know, reduce the emissions, uh, sustainable farming, and so forth. But right now, I am an advocate for green growth. I think it's important to know the context that Africa is, is an incredibly rich continent in terms of natural resources, but African countries and African populations own very little of these resources in comparison, especially when we talk about mineral resources like crude oil, and diamonds and, and conflict minerals, which are absolutely necessary for the insane rate of digitization we're going through. And this is, a, in, a, in the largest part, a colonial and sort of post-colonial legacy. Salma, your focus on food sovereignty, also from this perspective of the producers and their ownership and their relationship to what they produce. How the concept of like green growth and you know just basically the EU's foundations is very much based on this post-war trauma of kind of like and then the vision became we need to be able to sustain ourselves in a way where we can we can we are able to feed Europe.
And this also is the, like the entire foundation of like what colonialism is, like this expropriation, this extraction. Let me be the peasant here for a second, because admittedly, the great 20th century famines in Europe were caused by trying to feed the big metropolitan and, and uh, imperial centers and leaving a couple million people to die in return, including in Ukraine, in Kazakhstan, yes. and elsewhere. So it's, it's almost always about distribution as much as, you know, destruction. Yeah, yeah, very much. Like, it's also just, like, who is then, like, be being affected by this? I don't think that degrowth and mechanization um, don't have to, like, go hand in hand. It's There's always just this idea of, like, when we think of farmers or when we think of, like, indigeneity or all of these knowledges, it's always just, like, going back to this past where, you know, there is no technology, but there was always technology. You were also talking about seeds. Strains that we have now, these do come from a technology that have evolved with, like, hum humans um, over the years. Agriculture culture as we know it has undergone a huge process that we just can't and I think what degrowth in a lot of ways proposes is that we have to go back or that we have to stop um, and also talking about the Levant or generally uh, the, the like Southwest Asia uh, that region extending on to Egypt what was known as the agricultural crescent for the production of like thousands of strands of wheat only has like only cultivates around two now and talking about Palestine specifically. So this very much also controls the identity of this place. Farmers' reluctancy to, to engage in any form of like degrowth as well, when, when you propose to them that, hey, there's this heirloom variety, it's so much more sustainable, it's climate resilient, it relies only on like rainfall and doesn't mean so much irrigation or water, their response is, yeah, but it only produces a third of what this GMO hybrid like uh, strain would. And they're often the ones who are not producing for themselves and their communities. They are producing for a cash market. And when you try to sort of convert to a less interventionist mode of production, you want to abandon the industrial fertilizers. You don't want to spray so many pesticides, etc. It's a very long process. Mm -hmm. Uh, which oftentimes also includes completely different economic models. And now, a word from today's host. This program is hosted by the Elster Foundation Library, the knowledge hive serving both the research needs of scientific communities and the general public. Come visit them here in the Belvedere neighborhood of Vienna. Thank you, Elster Foundation. You can also become a supporter of the show and you don't even have to shred cabbage with me. All I ask is that you pledge your support at patreon.com slash Eurozine. That is Eurozine, the magazine presenting this program. You can pledge as little as five euros a month or whatever you can afford. And I promise we won't buy cabbages on it. Instead, you'll get access to bonus materials, invitations to the tapings of the show, and even get to submit topics and questions. I'm also thinking about it from my background and the communities that I'm studying to say these are mostly peasant farmers. If there would be an opportunity to grow on uh, small, smaller hectares, but yield more, that would be the way to go, right? Because the bigger the land to work on, you know, the more resources. Within Europe, when we talk about productivity or commercial viability, large-scale industrial agriculture is incredibly strongly subsidized. So it's not like it yields the profits just out of thin air. It is very, very reliant on state sub uh, subsidies, uh, interstate agreements, uh, trade subsidies, etc. But right now, these, these, let's say, more environmentally friendly, more viable, um, more humanly sustainable technologies are competing with big business that has big bucks funding it from the background. Uh, government subsidies would be another case altogether, but um, should the opportunity you know, allow for increased production and increased um, metric yields, then the better. When we get to Europe and North America really having an abundance of food, being well-fed immediately becomes 
a stigmatized position. Explain how, how does this come about and how does this work out for, for this discourse of self-constraint? So the wealthy bourgeois of the early 20th century, uh, they, they wore their bellies in front, front of themselves as a sign of pride, like, look at me, <laughs> I have enough to eat. They were proud of it because uh, the food uh, was a scarce, uh, a scarce material. So of the 20th century, the situation changed and uh, technologies provided us, uh, at least in the global north, uh, with an abundance of food. The aesthetics <laughs> of, of a body and the aesthetics of, of food changed uh, uh, completely. Today, uh, a rich body is a slim body, right? Uh, a body which uh, somehow ostensibly shows that it doesn't need to care about food. We also have to talk about a distribution of land here. Western ideal is big land masses, basically latifundia, industrially producing great masses of food, but I, I'm not convinced that these latifundia are actually ever bringing about equality in food. I want to refer back to a moment in 2021, like a lot of uh, wildfires going on in the Mediterranean region, and those also happened as well in Jerusalem. After the wildfires, like basically, um, you know, they were they were under control, etc. What was exposed under them was stone terraces um, that that were like 400 years old, which also served as a testimony of like the land and the way it looked like changes and it changed a lot due to also you know the factors like land grabbing, like colonialism. I'm, you know, as a big abolitionist, the only thing I can say is like basically abolish ownership and just also this conception of the nation state that also wants to have like this ownership over the land. Oftentimes in my research, when I read accounts from farmers in Palestine, and documenting ever, you know, everything that they're facing from their, their trees being burned to, you know, not having water because it's being controlled by the Israeli government. Most of them are like, you know, damn this, I don't care, I just want to farm. How then can these farmers also like foster this agency? If you, if you want to be sovereign, then we have to give the peasants also agency over how it is that they want to be with the land. So it's like when it comes to ownership, I think my only solution that I came with is really just erasure. And then when you erase this identity systemically, you also erase this relationship. The concentration of land ownership, we know it's a global problem and it's exacerbating. A growing ratio of the human population is moving to big metro areas. The cities are suffocating. Life in big cities is extremely vulnerable to food shortages or whatever kind of supplies you have. You don't really have means of mitigating a crisis on that level. But this frees up a lot of land mass for grabbing. Land ownership being very important to many um, African families because it means um, a security, you know, social security in many ways. Having a home, you know, your, your whole life is built around that, that land and also as um, a form of food security. I have my piece of land and I can do whatever I want on, on, on it. And I'm particularly talking about this in the context of um, Chimani Mani, right, for my study. So the case I'm looking at for South Africa is an informal settlement. Apartheid tendencies still going on. So what happened is after the floods, the government proposal has been, you could go back to your rural homes, you know. But the, their argument is we have like a preferred means of livelihood compared to going back to farm in the rural areas. Whereas in Chimani Mani there is more kin, there is more willingness to practice these um, adaptive uh, strategies um, towards um, sustainable agriculture, you know, and increasing the yield. But it's also a reflection of the communities themselves. One, it's a stable, rural, semi-urban, then the other is informal. In the wealthier parts of the globe, 
we tend to very quickly forget uh, about the origins of food. We tend to, 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 to take food for granted. Uh, we tend to forget about politics of food. For previous generations, it was, it was, uh, it was obvious because in Polish history, it was, it was obvious that if you, if you wanted food, if you needed food, you had to do something to get it. After the Second World War, people were moving from the rural areas to the cities. The government realized that uh, these people bring their country experiences with them. Communal gardens became very, very popular in Polish in Polish cities. And for example, my 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 grandparents they they always worked uh, in a in a garden of their own, producing their own food, and that gave them not only a small sense of you know food autonomy, but uh, it also I think reminded them that. Uh, Food uh, is a thing that comes from a place and there's always a human human labor involved. Are you excited about what's coming for the new European Parliament? Or maybe, on the contrary, deeply bored by it? Either way, Eurozine's got you covered. It's a recurring complaint that the European elections seem to be decided on the level of national politics. So, logically, we are looking into the regional perspectives to see who got to have a say in Brussels, how they get there and what they are going to do. Check out our focal point, Mood of the Union 2024, to read regional reports, analyses, prognoses and more. I think it is a very rotten compromise to have to make between a sort of rural agricultural existence, which then traps you in there, as opposed to a, a very alienated urban type of life. Basically, we would need to create a situation in which these are choices that are viable to make. To reiterate on like how food is very political, because I think like one aspect that we didn't touch on is really just like, you know, like famine is like also off obviously as or like starvation is a tool of war, is a weapon of war. We see this also happening around the world specifically also now in Gaza. Just a lot of accounts from also people in Gaza talking about how they did not, they, they were eating so much, like around a hundred times a day, um, just as a coping mechanism, knowing very well that they, will, they are starving and they don't have enough food to continue. So it's really, it's just like this also survival response of I'm going to eat as much as I can now because I won't have much for later instead of preserving food, you know, whether in abundance or in scarcity in, in relation to like our positionalities here is, you know, still is, is very much, you know, like a very active agent when it comes to politics. So at least when we talk about this, I, I don't think we, we can assign the responsibility for not saving it properly yeah. when you are being bombarded. Yeah. So that's, um, that's important. Um, drawing from the experiences of these communities, disaster stricken and conversations in general about climate change on and offline, and the experiences of the disaster stricken communities was they were there for each other as communities and survived before outside help came in, right? They survived, then help came in. It feels like a, it is a give and take situation. What are we willing to give up to, to give in, you know, and bring the development? The whole discourse on climate change, it emerged in the late 70s. So we've known about this for a long time and still, just yesterday I read this piece about how orange juice is going to just disappear for the global north and soon we will have to forego the morning orange juice and I thought to myself, what a catastrophe, what a nice problem to have, frankly, like am I going to miss orange juice? Yeah, is that a tragedy? Like, come on, <laughs> compared to the causes of this problem, why do we even discuss this in this tone where we are victimizing ourselves for having to adjust slightly to a, real a reality that's actually murdering people elsewhere. I just say that after watching this episode of Standard Time, take a look at your lunch plate, think about it, think about where it came from, and don't take it for granted. And if you have a belly, appreciate it. You might need it very soon. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very much. Keep it as your, as, as your savings account. Yes.
<laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, all three of you. This program is presented by Eurozine, an online magazine bringing you reads from more than 100 partner publications and across dozens of European languages. This talk show is a Display Europe production, a content sharing platform which offers content on politics, culture, community and so much more. It somehow, miraculously, also doesn't abuse your user data. I know, it's a shocker. Now, if you want us to have more of these cute graphics or just like what you see and wish to support our work, please go to patreon.com slash Eurozine. That is Eurozine, the magazine presenting this show. You can pledge as little as five euros a month or whatever you can afford, and I promise we won't spend it on cabbages. Instead, you'll get access to bonus materials, early access to the episodes of the show, and even get to suggest topics and questions. This program is co-funded by the Creative Europe program of the European Union and the European Cultural Foundation. Importantly, the views and opinions expressed here are those of the speakers and authors only and do not necessarily reflect those of the European Union or the European Education and Culture Executive Agency. Neither the European Union nor the EACA can be held responsible for them. I mean, I wouldn't mind if they took advice from us. We also thank the Erste Foundation Library for hosting us. Mm -hmm.